Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the presentation, everyone. This is one section of my Federal Grants 360 workshop. Rather than subject people to hours of slides and me talking, I'm breaking the workshop down into a handful of easily digestible presentations. I hope you enjoy them and find them useful. My objective in this presentation is to share with you the basics of federal grants, from where to find them, to how to apply for them, to what happens after you submit the application. And I'm also going to touch on how to determine if your organization is ready to apply for federal grants. All of the information in this presentation is applicable to private nonprofits and public organizations. We have a lot of slides to get through, so let's get moving. Now, before we get too deep, I just want to say thank you for being here. We all have a limited number of hours every day, and I really appreciate the time you're investing. Uh, this workshop isn't designed to be the repository of all knowledge related to finding and applying for federal grants. It's meant to give you a rock-solid foundation so you can get started. After watching the presentation, you might decide, hey, this is enough, and uh, you know, you can just get started, or you might decide to seek out another workshop from a different consultant's perspective, and that's great. I encourage it. My primary focus is on federal grants, and not all consultants are as specialized, and they can offer you insights on how to approach other funders like private, corporate, and community foundations. The thing about federal grants and grants in general is you learn the process best by jumping in, experimenting, and doing it. There's nothing wrong with the trial and error method uh, with grants. If so, if you've avoided federal grants in the past, hopefully I'll answer most of your questions so you can feel confident enough to you know at least take the plunge and and get get rolling. Uh, of course, if you have any questions about the information in this presentation, please do not hesitate to contact me. <clears throat> Excuse me. The website is on the top of every slide. Uh, my Twitter and Instagram handle are also uh, at the top of every slide, and some more detailed contact information will be at the end of the presentation. And just for reference purposes, here's a table of contents if you need to check back with the slides later. All right, now let's get rolling. So a good place to start, of course, is by establishing a common understanding of what a grant is and what grants are for. Uh, this grant from the, I'm sorry, this definition from the Government Accountability Office covers it nicely. And to narrow it down even further, we're only going to cover program grants to organizations. Uh, this talk doesn't apply to student grants, like for colleges or trade schools, nothing of that nature. This is all grants to organizations, public and private. Sorry about that, doing a little housekeeping here. There are two main types of federal grants available to organizations, entitlement or formula grants, and discretionary, also known as competitive grants. As the name suggests, entitlement grants are provided to organizations based on a predetermined formula. For example, a, a grant for an after-school program might tell grantees they'll receive $100 per student based on certain eligibility, eligibility criteria. Boy, can I say eligibility? Eligibility. All right, there we go. Um, like free and reduced lunch program enrollment. Discretionary grants, on the other hand, are awarded to organizations through a competitive application process. We're going to focus our discussion 
on discretionary grants available to nonprofits, cities, counties, and school districts. This slide, uh, this slide here illustrates the flow of federal funding from you know, congressional, congressional and presidential approval through appropriations and the award of funds to grantees. We are going to concentrate on steps number five and six. There are five main steps in the life cycle of a federal grant from pre-award through closeout. On the left-hand side of this graphic, you'll see the actions that are taken by the federal agencies at each step in the process, and on the right, the steps taken by the grant applicants. And before going any further, let's spend a minute talking about what grants are not. There are a lot of misconceptions about federal grants due in large part to infom infomercials and online advertising for like the last couple of decades, claiming that grants can pay for all sorts of expenses. Grants are for activities and programs that serve a public purpose and have a public benefit. Housing the homeless, improving literacy, expanding utilities in rural areas, improving transportation infrastructure, and on and on and on. The, the government doesn't make grants like to start a business or to, to pay off your debt. And you, you, really, you really shouldn't want it to because it's just, it would be a pain. I think this kind of says it all right here. the The notion that the, that there's there's free government money out there is just a a flat out myth. All right, now let's let's start getting into the good stuff. So we touched on the federal grant life cycle a few slides back, and organizations have a similar life cycle when it comes to federal grants or any grants for that matter. You know, first you have the pre-award phase and this is where you assess your readiness to apply. So for example, you look at your systems, your capacity and your human capital resources, you develop your program, you prepare your application and you begin your initial conversation about program sustainability. Then, in, in blue, you have the post-award, uh, assuming that you're awarded the grant. And this is kind of the, the nuts and bolts get-to-work phase. Your program implementation, your grant management, evaluation, and reporting. It's also when you pick up the sustainability conversation again. After that, closeout. This is where you wrap up the grant with the funding agency and prepare your records for storage during the retention period. But closeout is more than simply turning in your, your final report. This is the time to reflect uh, on the grant and the program's performance and to get feedback from everyone involved. What worked well? What didn't work? What can be done differently the next time around? Uh, you know, this post-grant debrief is essential to improving things you know, the next go around. And then finally, what's next? Now it's time to think about the next problem you want to address. This isn't about sustaining the, the grant program that just closed. I'm talking about how can you advance your organization's mission and expand your reach with a new program solving a new problem.
So today we're going to cover the pre-award phase. Is your organization ready for federal grants? And this is the first question every organization's leadership should ask before going after federal funds. But it's rarely the first question asked. And in fact, it's rarely asked, period. Normally, the first question people ask are, where can we find a federal grant and how do we get one? Just because you think you're ready doesn't mean you are ready. So let's take a look at what readiness means. I won't read all of these. I'll just give you a moment to scan over them. Keep in mind that these aren't hard and fast rules. These are just characteristics of successful organizations I've worked with in my career. And if you, if you want to go deep on assessing your organization's readiness, we have a free grant readiness assessment tool in the resources uh, section of our website at thegrantdoctors.com. You know, I think it's a, it's a really valuable tool. It's totally free. There's no obligation. You don't have to give us your email address, your phone number, or anything like that. You just go to the website, click on resources uh, on the services page, download it. You know, we'll, we'll never know if you download it and use it or not. Just go, just go for it. It's like the worst sales pitch ever. <laughs> I just want to let I know there's some so many services out there um, that they they offer you free stuff, but it comes with strings attached like, you know, this is free, but you have to give us your email address and then you'll start hearing from us every three days by our services. No, that is not how we roll. All right. So once you determine that you're ready, the next question is. Do you have a problem to solve? Just needing or wanting money is not a sufficient answer. You need to have a clearly identified problem, a clear purpose for the funding, and the ability to manage the program and the funds. Again, I won't read each of these, just... Uh, just, you know, scan through them on your own time or right here as I talk. Um, that makes the most sense. Good, good thinking, Dave. All right. So <laughs> here's some key, key points to consider as you develop your program and pay particular attention to the second point. You know, any problem you want to solve needs to be supported by data. Uh, you need to be able to prove that the problem is real and not based on a hunch or limited information. Now, we're going to assume that your organization has a, a 501c3 or it's a public agency has an employee identification number or tax ID number, you satisfy the readiness tests from the previous slides, you identified a problem, and you have a viable solution, you have a DUNS number, you're registered with the System for Award Management, also known as SAM, and you have a grants.gov account. If you don't have a DUNS number, or you're not registered with SAM, or you don't have a grants.gov account, check out the videos and instructions available at grants.gov. They have a lot of people put knocks on the government for inefficiency and bureaucracy, whatever, but grants.gov does an extremely good job, very user-friendly. Uh, just the, a lot of the videos and the content they put out, whether it's on YouTube, or on the website or in their blog, lots of really good information for, you know, first time and even advanced grant seekers. It's a really user-friendly site. I highly encourage you to go 
spend some time on grants.gov. Just bounce around. It's a lot to take in, but very, very useful. And one thing I should mention, it's not like with Dun, Sam, and grants.gov, it's not difficult uh, to complete those registrations, but it is time consuming. So don't wait until the last minute if you're applying for a grant. There is no downside to registering early, even if you don't plan on applying for a grant anytime soon. The thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes it can take up to, you know, 10 days to three weeks to complete all of these different registrations. So if if you think that, you know, three days before you apply for a grant that you can just jam all these through, that's not the case. You really want to start early. And in every grant application package, it tells you start early and they they tell you 30 days. And that's that's not bad. But like I said, even if you don't plan on applying for a grant in the next six months, just register and get all of this out of the way. It'll save you so much time and, and stress uh, later on down the road. And you've already got enough stress up against a deadline. You don't need to add to it uh, by not knowing if you'll get registered in time to submit. So that's my long-winded two cents. Oh, the registrations... <laughs> This is another hot topic for me. The registrations are 100% free. You don't need to pay to register with any of these systems. There are there are a lot of people out there that try to tell, especially like new and experienced organizations that, you know, pay us $1,000 and we'll get you your registrations. No, just, you know, put in a few hours, bang it out, get it done totally free. You don't need to pay anyone to access these, these sites. All right. Assuming that all your registrations are squared away, now it's time to search for the grants. There are three key places that post new federal grant announcements. The Federal Register, Grants.gov, and the individual department websites. Grants.gov is a little more user-friendly, uh, but I prefer to start with the Federal Register because the information tends to post earlier in the morning than Grants.gov, and also Monday's notices in the Federal Register post on Saturday or Sunday if it's a three-day weekend. So it kind of gives you a little sneak peek of what's coming that first day of the business week. That's that's why I like it. And here's a look at the Federal Register's homepage. In the top of the bar, click on Current Issue. Well, where am I? Sorry, I lost my place. What happens is on that next page, after you click current issue, you're taken to a list of all the announcements for the day. Agencies and departments are listed in alphabetical order. You can scroll down the page if there's a specific department you want, or you can click on a department name on the right side of the screen, and it will jump you down the page to that department. The number next to the department name indicates the number of announcements that day. Uh, they're, not, they're not always going to be funding announcements, but just the number of announcements in general that department released on that, on that day. And with the calendar feature, you can look at past issues by clicking on a, clicking on a specific day or going into a previous month Except, well, you get the picture. <laughs> Rather than scrolling down the page and reading everything and potentially missing something, uh, I like to use the keyword search. So in your browser, find the, or use the, find in page or search feature 
at the top of the browser or sometimes it's at the bottom of the page. Either way, uh, you I think you'll know it. It's usually like a command F and it opens up a little search box. If that doesn't work, you know, try the edit pull down menu. There should be a search option there too. The one thing you want to know is and I put a little red cross mark over it is don't use the federal registers search documents box if you if you use that you'll end up searching the entire federal register across all dates you only want to search on this one page for the current issue and when you find a grant uh, announcement just click on the link and more information will open up There we go. These are the four search terms that I use. Not every grant announcement uses all of these words, but they will have at least one of them. I start with grant, just for obvious reasons. Then I search uh, for the term fund, and then, uh, then I go for award, and lastly, application. Application is the broadest search term and usually turns up results that aren't relevant to grants. So for example, uh, companies applying for permits to do business with other countries or radio station license renewals or endangered species permits all show up under the application term. After the Federal Register, head over to grants.gov and click on the Search Grants icon. If you're curious, I did a little, a really brief video on, uh, on our YouTube channel about how to search for grants on grants.gov. But this will give you a step-by-step -step guide as well. All right, so we're clicking on the Search Grants icon. And search grants will then take you to this page, which on this particular day had over 2,400 announcements, way too many, and most are irrelevant for your needs. So you need to narrow down the search to a manageable amount. Over where the uh, yellow arrow is, click on cooperative agreements and grants in the funding instrument type box. A cooperative agreement is essentially the same thing as a grant, but it has, quote unquote, substantial federal involvement, which means they, they might assign a technical assistance support person to help implement your program, or the agency might provide uh, land, equipment, or other resources during the course of the grant. It's essentially the same as a grant. Don't worry about the terminology at this point. Uh, I've worked with cooperative agreements. They're it, the piece of cake. Don't worry about it. But that's those are the two you want to you want to search on. All right. So from the again, looking at the yellow arrow, from the date range pull down menu, select the time frame that you want to search, and then click on the update date range button next to it. I check grants.gov every day, so I prefer to limit my search to the previous three days to keep the results short and sweet. It's entirely up to you how far back you want to search. Again, I like to do it every day just so I don't miss anything. But if federal grants aren't that you know, as high of a priority for you, maybe you only check it on Mondays or Fridays or Wednesdays, whatever, and then just search for the previous you know, five to seven days. On the right side of the screen, you'll see the dates when the grant was posted and the grant's deadline or the closing date. Uh, when you find a grant opportunity, you just click on the funding opportunity number in the left-hand column, and it will take you to more information. So 
So once you click on the funding opportunity number, you're taken to a page like this that shows you all the information about the grant, the amount of funding, the estimated number of awards, the eligible applicants, a description of the program, and oftentimes a link to the department's website with even more information sometimes. And if you decide this is a grant you want to pursue, click on the Package tab at the top of the page. Once you click on Package, you're going to see this type of information and where the yellow arrow is, click Preview to download the instructions and to look at the application's forms. Click Apply right next to it to get started. Make sure you always check both sources. Sometimes opportunities post on one site and not the other, and sometimes there's a delay posting to one of the sites. I've seen several cases where there's as much as a two-week delay for the same grant announcement to post on each site. So for example, something might show up in the Federal Register and then two weeks later in grants.gov or vice versa. Two weeks is kind of an extreme, extreme case, but I've seen it, you know, more times than I'm comfortable with. So it's it's important to always check both so you, you don't miss anything. I mean, you would think that that new grants would post on both sites on the same day, but it doesn't always happen. And if there's, I mean, if really, if it's a week or two, I mean, that could be a lot of planning time that you need. Uh, and you just, you don't want to get caught, caught behind. So check both. Now, another place to search for federal grants is each department's website. Here's one example at the Department of Education. They make it real easy. Right at the top of the page, grants. Click on that and you are off to the races. Here's another example at the Department of Health and Human Services. Not every department has a link to grants on their homepage. Sometimes you need to poke around a little bit before you find it. So either use a search tool on a department's website if it's not real clear on the homepage, or maybe look for a site map where you can just scan very quickly all the pages on their site to hopefully find something specific to grants. The final place to look for federal grants online is the Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance also known as the CFDA. It's a good resource for general information about grant programs, but it's not very timely. Uh, I use it to research programs and historical funding amounts, but I don't use it to find any new or upcoming grants. It's really not, it's not suited for that purpose. Now, before you start writing, carefully go through the Notice of Funding Opportunity. It has all of the information you need to decide if you want to submit a proposal. It gives you a description of the funding and the agency's priorities, the total amount of funds available, and the estimated number of grants and award amounts, what types of organizations are eligible or not eligible to apply, the uh, the application format and deadline, how the pro how the proposals will be evaluated, the agency contact information, and any other details as necessary. This here is a list of sections commonly found in federal applications. Of course, every application is different, you know, and an application to education will be different than 
an application to health and human services or transportation. In general, though, in general, though, this is what applicants can expect. It may not be exactly in this, you know, in this order or this format, but you can pretty much expect to answer these types of, you know, questions or issues. And these are not always standalone sections. Uh, sometimes sections are merged with each other. So like the scope of work and sustainability might be a subsection of the program description section. So just always follow the instructions for each funding opportunity. Uh, and let's go through each of these. All right, so in general, the executive summary is a one to two page outline of the problem you're addressing, a summarize any data that illustrates the existence and severity of the problem, your proposed solution and how your solution matches federal priorities, uh, a brief statement about your organization's background and its capacity to implement the program and to manage the, the federal grant, if it's appropriate, you can mention how much funding you're requesting and if your organization is contributing any matching funds. But as a side note, some agencies don't want to read any budget information outside of the budget section. So make sure it's okay to mention these details before including them in the executive summary or your application narrative. The problem or need statement goes into detail about the program you want to solve. Be sure that you can support the issue with data. Local data is preferred over statewide and national data. If the incidence of your problem is significantly higher than statewide or national averages, absolutely make sure that that stands out in your narrative. This is the section where you make a connection with the reviewers and draw them into your solution. So tell your story and make them want to keep reading. The program description is your opportunity to share your proposed solution and how it matches the federal priorities. So part of this will include the implementation timeline and scope of work, Make sure that you clearly describe the program you want to implement and why it was chosen as the ideal solution. Describe the demand for service and how it was established. This ties all back to your needs, uh, your need statement. The key here is demonstrating that you've developed a thoughtful and viable solution to the problem. The program description will also include an implementation timeline uh, and a scope of work. So what actions are you going to, going to take? What are your progress milestones? When are you going to accomplish them? And who is responsible for completing each task? This is one example. If your RFA requires a specific format, be sure to use that. Uh, this and the next example are just that, guides in case you need a place to start. Here's another scope of work example. Similar information as the previous table, but less detail on the timeline. The budget and budget narrative are fairly straightforward. The budget table summarizes your funding request into broad categories like personnel, fringe, travel, etc. And the narrative gives you the, it's kind of the meat or the substance behind uh, 
the summary. So the, the narrative describes you know, in detail how the money will be spent. Make sure that all of your expenses are allowable by consulting the notice of funding opportunity and the federal cost principles. The funding notice will clearly spell out prohibited expenses. Also, make sure you correctly categorize your expenses. So for example, most people get confused by the equipment category. And I mean, we all have in our, in our mind what equipment means, but equipment is a specific term to federal officials. And to them, equipment is an item with a unit value of $5,000 or more and a useful life of over one year. Everything outside of that is categorized as supplies. Now, of course, if your organization's policies have a different threshold for equipment or capital expenses, you should use your figure, uh, unless your equipment threshold is less restrictive than the federal amount. You can have a more restrictive threshold, say 3,000 or 2,000 or whatever, but you can't have a less restrictive amount than the feds. Now at the bottom where it says indirect of that table, the sample table, if you have a negotiated indirect cost rate with the, with the feds, you can charge it to the grant. Uh, if not, and if your organization has never had an indirect cost rate with the feds, you can charge a de minimis 10% rate of the modified total direct cost. Now, if you're asking what the hell is modified total direct cost, don't worry about this now. I'll discuss it later in another presentation. Until then, if the notice of funding opportunity doesn't clearly explain it, just contact me and I'll walk you through it. The evaluation section discusses your program goals and objectives, how you will monitor your progress and results. The evaluation serves as a feedback loop for the program and helps you make adjustments as necessary. Evaluation doesn't need to be complicated. What you need is a simple, easily manageable system to monitor your program's impact. Now, I recommend you work with a project evaluator in this phase to design your evaluation. You know, as you're preparing your application, contact a local evaluator. We have several evaluators that we can recommend, or you might reach out to a, a nearby university to see if a graduate student is looking for some additional work. But by all means, evaluators are worth, <laughs> are worth their weight in gold. So as, you're, as you are developing your application, try to find an evaluator early on so that they can help you shape the evaluation section of the application, but also they might be able to provide advice on your program design as well. Now, organizational capacity describes your experience in managing projects and your, compa your capacity to manage public funds. How long have you been around? Who are the key players on the project and what's their experience? What's your experience managing grants? What types of financial controls does your organization have? It's all good stuff like that. Now, sustaining programs is a challenge for even the most successful organizations. You want to spend some time thinking about program longevity and come up with a, come up with a realistic plan. The feds want to see that you can maintain momentum without having to seek out another grant. Planning teams get so caught up with designing effective programs they often overlook the sustainability issue, and it's not their fault. You know, tight grant deadlines don't always afford people the luxury to forecast future revenues 
and demand for services in the end will apply for another grant becomes the unwritten strategy. And keep in mind, you define sustainability. Does it mean continuing your program at 100%, 100% strength, or can it be downsized to a point where existing funds and other sources, uh, sources of revenue can support it? Sustainability doesn't require you to continue a program exact, exactly as it operated during the grant. If you need to scale it back to, say, 75% of its former self, that's fine. I mean, 75% of something is better than 100% of nothing. So what are the, some of the things to consider regarding sustainability? Well, one, take a hard look at all your current funding. What do you have that could be redirected to support your new program after a grant ends? And everything should be on the table at this point, including scaling back other programs if the new one proves more effective. Second, don't launch new programs with just a single funding source. Ideally, use two or three funding streams. So if, if or when one source drops off, the program won't be as severely impacted. Also, providing matching funds makes for a stronger proposal. Third, design your programs so they can be easily expanded and contracted based on available funding and demand. Fourth, explore ways the program could generate revenue to offset some costs. This is usually a pretty complicated um, idea and sometimes controversial because a lot of people, when they, people, organizations, when they start uh, their, their grant programs, they want them to be free of charge. But there's, there's nothing that prohibits you from charging for services or finding other ways to to generate uh, to generate income income to offset costs and fifth keep your eyes and ears open your eyes and ears open for ways to partner with other organizations so launch a communications campaign with local and state officials responsible for various funding sources if they don't know about your organization and your work they can't keep you in mind for unexpected supplemental funding their office might receive. Rem remember, you're in partnerships with funders. They have goals they want to accomplish, and organizations like yours have the means to help them. And finally, networking, network with organizations similar to yours that are providing complementary or sometimes even duplicative services find ways to capitalize on each other's strengths and to leverage resources in a way that will expand both of your organization's reach. <laughs> Remember, this is not a sustainability plan. Just if if these if these one, two, three, four, if these five words ever enter your brain and you think about passing them through your lips, just stop. This is not a sustainability plan. The appendices is where you'll place all of the supplemental material that you want to include with your application that won't count against the page limit. And here are some examples. Only include documents that are specifically required by the funding agency. Just adding a bunch of extra documents that aren't requested often does more harm than good. So stick to whatever the notice of funding opportunities tells you to submit. Don't go overboard. All right, well, now that we know what's involved with the application, 
How do we start start working on it so we're not crunched at deadline? Pretty simple. Just start with the deadline and work backwards to the present day. So just re reverse engineer your calendar, starting with the deadline. Uh, in fact, do you want to apply on the deadline or perhaps a couple of days early? If you want to submit, say an application is due on, I don't know, 30 days, has September, April, June, let's just say July 30, or April, May, I don't know, June 30th. Let's go with that. Well, that was a long road to get to June 30th. All right. Say you want to apply on June 30th, or that's the deadline. Your deadline is June 30th. Maybe you want to want to apply on the 27th. So that's where you start working backwards from. You know, how many days will you give yourself for last minute changes and a final proofread? So deadline is June 30th. You want to apply on the 27th. Maybe you want to have everything wrapped up mm, on the 25th so that you have a couple of days of cushion to do that that final proofread to make any last minute changes if you're having trouble getting some documents uh, from maybe external partners or for your appendices you've got that little bit of wiggle room before you submit and speaking of external partners when do you need their letter of commitment you know, just start marking all of these milestones on your calendar, beginning with the deadline and when you want to submit and working backwards. If you're writing in a team environment, when is each person's section due to the team lead? And how many opportunities will you give yourself to proofread and rewrite each section? So rather than just having the team start from day one, just writing, 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 and then turning everything in a couple of days to you or the team lead in a couple of days before deadline, maybe they turn in drafts on a weekly basis so that you're constantly reviewing and refining uh, your document all the way throughout the process until you submit. And just another shameless plug if you go to the resources section of our website we have sample time timelines for grant applications with 30 45 day and 60 day uh, deadlines just to give you an idea of where to start and when you might want to have all of these documents due to your your team lead and it should go without saying, but I will say it. If you download those timelines, they are not cast in stone. Feel free to modify them to however you need to work with them best. Okay. After you submit your application, a committee will read and score your proposal against the evaluation criteria mentioned in the notice of funding opportunities. Typically, multiple reviewers uh, read every proposal. Uh, the exact number varies by program. And this normalizes, normalizes the scores and prevents bias of any one reviewer. Based on the available funding, a minimum score will be established for successful applicants. Applicants above that score will receive funding. Applicants below will not receive funding, but they might be placed on a hold list if additional funding becomes available or if one of the higher scoring applicants drops out. In some cases, applicants just below that, that cut line or minimum score line uh, might receive funding based on additional uh, criteria or priorities of the funding agency. That is, the agency might want to spread the grants around geographically if a number of successful applicants are all clustered in one area. Or the agency might award a grant if an applicant 
addresses a priority not met by other applicants. So for example, if an agency has a priority to fund projects in rural areas, but only a few applicants targeted rural areas, the agency might dip below the cut line to fund a project for that uh, specific priority. If your proposal is funded, you'll receive a conditional award, but there are a few more steps to go through before the grant award is finalized. Specifically, the pre-award capacity review to take a deeper look at your organization, assigning any high-risk conditions if necessary, uh, the pre-award conference call to hammer out final details, and of course, issuing the grant award notice. Don't worry about the pre-award review at this point. Uh, if you're curious, we have a training video devoted to the pre-award assessment and how you can address some of its elements in your application. That's also on our YouTube channel, so check it out. Now, this is this is important. If your proposal is not funded, always reach out to the agency and request a copy of the reviewer's score sheets uh, and comments. You, it's important to find out your proposal's strengths and weaknesses and see how other organizations address the grant requirements if you're able to get a copy of uh, a successful applicant's proposal. Start planning for the next round of funding or the next available funding source don't wait until new funding is announced because, again, you'll be pushed into that 30 or 60 day deadline window. You know, get back to working, get back to work addressing your weaknesses and tweaking the program to make it stronger. You know, you never know when funding will become available. So always be prepared. And lastly, a few strategies for preparing applications. Make your application easy for the reviewers to follow. If questions are numbered in the application, make it clear which questions you're addressing in your narrative. Connect the dots for the readers so they have an easier time scoring your application. And make sure they know you're answering all the questions. You, you don't want to lose points because a reviewer didn't understand how your responses connected to the application's criteria or questions. Make it as user-friendly as possible. So like I said, just connect the dots for everyone. Oh, of course, don't miss the deadline. <laughs> Obviously. Now, before you just jump in head first, keep this in mind. Just because you can apply for a federal grant doesn't mean you always should apply. Seriously consider whether a grant opportunity is in the best interest of your organization. Organization. Does it fit with your vision and mission? Is it aligned with your existing operations? Or is it outside of your expertise? Does it really complement your services or expand your mission? Or are you just chasing the dollars? And do you have the capacity to manage the program? You know, sometimes it's better to pass on a grant and wait for a better opportunity than to invest the time and resources on a long shot. Whew. Well, that's all I have. Here we are on slide number 54. Good Lord. I hope that's all I have. Thank you very much for listening to me. Again, I appreciate the time you spend here. If you have any questions, please email me through my website or reach out on social media. I'm here to help. If you found this useful, like it or give it a thumbs up. 
feel free to leave a comment. I love feedback. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future presentations. Thanks. See you next time.